What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, sponsored by peer-run support communities Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Welcome to our new broadcast station, KBOO, in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Mary Olson. Mary is a family therapist and scholar. She's a professor at the Smith College School for Social Work, and she received a Fulbright grant to study alternative mental health care in Finland. We're going to be speaking about open dialogue, which is a very innovative approach to working with people who are experiencing extreme crisis. Mary is also the founder of the Mill River Institute. Thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. Mary Olson. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Mary, you are working on um, helping people in the United States learn about a very innovative approach in Finland and Northern Europe called Open Dialogue, um, which uses families and social networks to address the context of someone who is experiencing what gets called psychosis or extreme um, distress. And the Open Dialogue um, approach has been very successful in Finland. Before we get into the the details in the background, just give us an overview of how successful this approach has been in Finland, because it's been able to um, help people make it through a crisis um, using much, much lower amounts of medication and having getting them back into school, getting them back to work um, with much better success than some of the more traditional approaches. Is that right? That's right. Um, we now have research that goes back starting in the early 80s on open dialogue. We have outcome studies and we have what's called quasi-experimental or comparison studies. And all of the studies suggest that young people who were first, who were experiencing a first episode of what we call psychosis, who uh, received open dialogue treatment, were much more likely after five years to be in school um, job seeking or looking for a job than people who received treatment as usual. They also showed fewer return episodes and the use of medication was significantly lower. So people traditionally in the United States would have some kind of extreme emotional state, they would go to the hospital, um, it gets called psychosis or they get called schizophrenic, and then they go into a treatment approach which is, okay, it's a, it's a medical problem, it's a biological problem, take your meds, and we know from the studies in the U.S. and from the experiences of people that the effectiveness is really low. People stay on medications and disability long term, there are the huge problems and side effects with medication, they really don't get recovery from any kind of meaningful sense if you look at the overall uh, results of this kind of approach. And the um, open dialogue model in um, Finland is actually leading to much higher rates of recovery with much lower, lower medication. Right. There was a comparison study with a group in Sweden, and they found that in the open dialogue treatments that only 20% ended up on disability in contrast to the Swedish group where 80% ended up on disability. So there's a huge difference there and that kind of really significant difference seems to, to be borne out in all the comparisons of open dialogue with treatment as usual. So when I stumbled across these statistics 10 years ago, I became very interested in what were the Finns doing that we weren't doing here? And they're doing a lot of things differently than we do here. And what's important to, to remember is that this is not a, a single small program in Finland. This is actually a very widespread, very established approach that's been going on for decades. And it's been very effective. It involves many hospitals, many professionals, and many thousands of clients. Is that right? Well, in Finland itself, it's been established at Karaputis Hospital, um, it was began to be developed there uh, starting in the mid-80s. And since that time, as these outcome studies started to come out of Finland, it garnered international interest. And so now there are open dialogue teams throughout northern Europe, Russia, and the Baltic states. So 
in Finland, the home of Open Dialogue is Karaputis Hospital. But now there are teams who are trying to bring this into their settings, as I said, throughout Europe, Russia, and the Baltic states. And this is part of your work. You're also helping to educate people and starting the Mill River Institute in the U.S. to get some more awareness of this alternative approach in the U.S. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about that uh, later. How did you get interested in this? I know you have a, you're a family therapist and you have a background in um, family therapy. How did you get interested and how did you sort of discover um, open dialogue? Well, in the late, mid to late 90s, um, I became interested in what was happening to family therapy in the Pioneer Valley where I work. And it seemed to me that family therapy was disappearing from agencies and clinics. And I joined a group of researchers at Smith and we began to try to understand not only family therapy, but why relational approaches in general seem to be losing ground in clinics and agencies. And what we discovered, and we've written about this, is that the influence of managed care in a very restrictive economic context and this very strong emphasis on psychopharmacology has created this new mental health system that privileges psychopharmacology and downgrades all forms of therapy. And the results have been quite dramatic in terms of community mental health in particular, support for training, the whole kind of relational infrastructure of the clinic itself as well, as well as relational approaches to therapy, that whole establishment began to really dissolve under the effects of, of managed care. So managed care comes in in the 90s, and so you see these therapeutic-based uh, approaches, not just family therapy, but individual therapy as well, psychological understandings, decline, and it really just starts to become medication-pushing and seeing things in terms of bio- biology and brain disorders and the sort of genetic framework of we have to deal with your body chemistry rather than looking at the meaning of people's experience. Now, I know that open dialogue is different than traditional family therapy, but it comes out of that tradition. I think the idea in family therapy is, is really positive, although there are a lot of problems with family therapy as it's been used in the U.S. and elsewhere. But the idea is that the really the problem you have to understand is in a context, that the people come out of a social context where it's really about, as you say, relational. It's the relationships that people are in that need help and that someone who's identified as the psychotic one or the crazy one actually is in this whole network of family relations that also need help, that are problematic as well. And so when family therapy, you address the context, not just the individual. So there are a lot of really positive things about that, that unfortunately we've lost as it's gone down in the managed care era. And I think, you know, there are other, there are other forces at play that, that turn family therapy into, or turn that family, that family therapy turned the family into another sort of unit of pathology. But the original vision of people who were first proposing the idea of looking at the family, the the real idea they were interested in was looking at people in a context rather than simply the individual. So your, your experience, however crazy, has meaning, however psychotic people are saying you are, your experience has meaning if it's understood as a response and a connection to and a relationship with your surroundings. That in some sense, whatever you're going through is adaptive. It's a logical response. Yeah, so originally what was exciting about family therapy is that it really says that this this psychosis, so-called, is really understood in the context of the surroundings that the person is in, not just inside the individual. It is a response to a situation, a context. It's not just the random malfunctioning or arbitrary malfunctioning or or unfolding of a genetic script. And the idea that I think we have difficulty, so much difficulty with in our culture, is holding the idea that an experience may be meaningful and it may be a response to a context without condemning and pathologizing the person and those around them. You know, family therapy originally tried to introduce a non-pathologizing framework, and yet it's been 
kind of co-opted by a way of thinking that tends to look at things in a linear manner as cause and effect, in, which invariably ends up with blame, either blame assigned to the individual, blame assigned to the parents. And, that, and it's much more complicated than that. It's an effort to try to provide understanding and make, and make sense of a situation without assigning crippling blame either to the person at the center of the crisis or to those who are surrounding them. And I think family therapy today in the United States is tends to be more in social agencies where it's low-income families that are focused on, and then you have this idea of the dysfunctional family, the family is broken, and then you get into this pathology and blaming of the of the entire family system itself is seen as the problem, but it's really there's a big class element and a, and a discrimination against poverty element that, that goes on. And then it's tied exactly. to the criminal justice system, and you get this sort of social control side of it as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. But the positive part of family therapy is this idea that there's meaning. And I think before we get into open dialogue, and I think that open dialogue is an innovation. It comes out of the tradition of family therapy, but it's an innovation that um, addresses some of these limitations that we're talking about. Um, before we get into that, one of the ideas from family therapy, which I think is really interesting to look at, is this idea of the double bind. Can you just sort of sketch what that is and then how psychosis is an adaptive response or madness is a way of dealing with a crazy situation in a sense. The original formulation of the double bind was by Gregory Bateson and his colleagues um, in the 50s, actually out there in Palo Alto, California. Long story short, the double bind came to mean that someone is in a context, uh, a life important context, a, por uh, a context where it's critical to, to distinguish what is being said and what kinds of meanings are operative. And within that context, there are, there are conflicting meanings that paralyze the person and can also paralyze people around them. So it's a situation where on, there's one level, there's an injunction on one level, and it's contradicted by an injunction on a second level. So an example might be a parent who tells a child that they love them unconditionally, but whenever the child starts to speak about what they're interested in or what their life is about, the parent interrupts them and stops listening to them. So they're getting this mixed message on one level, I care about you, you're you're good, I'm interested in you, but on the other level of their communication, it's, I'm not interested in you, I don't want to hear you, I want to silence you. Now that would be the first and simple, simplest example. Um, the problem with that is that Bateson came to see, again, that that was too blaming of the parent, that it's very much about a victim and a victimizer. And as his thinking evolved, he began to think about double binds across a whole system. And an example of that would be there was a study of head injury patients. And in studying the whole ecology around the patient with a head injury, the researcher discovered that the patient and the family were all receiving conflicting messages from providers about how independent the person should be encouraged to be or how dependent on services. So there were all these conflicting messages regarding independence and dependence. And the result, according to this researcher, who then used this double bind theory to try to analyze the data, is that it generates a kind of mistrust in the caregivers it increases aggressive behavior, and it makes the person who's not in a coherent and integrated treatment system much more likely to become symptomatic in various ways. So if someone is having symptoms or there's a problem or their crisis is worsening, a double bind theory approach would say, hey, let's look at the people around them. Let's look at the providers, let's look at the family, let's look at the social network here and see, are there conflicting messages? And is this problematic behavior, is this crisis actually a way of adapting 
and understood meaningfully in the context of the messages that the person is receiving or that the family is receiving or the system is receiving. So that would be an example, but it's that kind of what we call iatrogenic issues, in other words, the disease created by the doctor, where they, they originally started working this way when they saw that it was very, very important to have an integrated treatment system helping a family and person in distress. So in addressing why an individual might be in distress or might be having a crisis that's called psychotic or an emotional extreme, looking at the, the context and the way that that's a response to and the system itself can actually be crazy making, it can actually be generating the circumstances that trigger this response rather than seeing it in the, in the individual. And, and family therapy, the way it's kind of gone in the U.S., has kind of gone in this, this direction of blaming families and it's very focused on low income families often. And so that's what I think is interesting about open dialogue is that in Finland, they've really addressed some of the problems with family therapy and they have a more innovative approach. And this was developed primarily by the um, clinician Jaco Sekula. And tell us just about what open dialogue is and then how it actually uh, works now that we've got sort of this overview of, um, of family therapy as a, as a background. Well, open dialogue um, originally developed when traditional family therapy in Karaputis Hospital, which is a hospital in northwest Finland, when they tried to do tra a traditional family therapy approach in the hospital, it failed. The families didn't really want to be part of those kinds of conversations. So open dialogue began with what was called a treatment meeting. And a treatment meeting is a meeting about treatment. In other words, what kind of therapy should we offer this person in this family? What is going to work in this situation? And what they found is that offering this meeting to talk about therapy was in itself very therapeutic and helpful. So part of the sort of Finnish genius, I think, is this idea of this no therapy therapy. In other words, the treatment meeting was a meeting where they had the person at the center of concern, any family members who were involved in the crisis, anyone else who might be connected to the crisis, anyone else the person wanted to be there, plus all the professionals that were attached to the situation. So it's really a social network. It's not looking specifically at the family, but all the different meaningful relationships that the person is in in their life. Exactly. And they, they abandoned this notion, really, of the, of the system that needed to be corrected. And they focused much more on the immediate crisis and the event of this treatment meeting. And the goal of the treatment meeting was to try to develop some common understanding of the problem. And by doing that, professionals needed to use ordinary language. They couldn't use all this mystified labeling language. And the idea was that everyone in the meeting has a voice. Everyone is an equal partner in trying to resolve or find a constructive response to what's going on. So it as a result of this meeting, there was less professional hierarchy. There wasn't the professional jargon, which can lead to objectifying the person in the family. So the Finns began to see that this, this sort of treat, this meeting about what do we do next without actually thinking of it as therapy was in and of itself extremely therapeutic because it was so non pathologizing and equalizing. And everybody had a voice. So there's a really kind of common sense element to this, which is if someone's in trouble, you just gather everybody around that person who's connected with them you in with some helpers who have some experience with these kinds of issues and these kinds of problems, and then you just have an open discussion where everybody is free to talk and to express themselves. No one is on a higher level than anyone else, and um, different ways of communicating are respected because I think what's important about the open dialogue approach is that the person who's in madness or an extreme crisis, even if they are talking or not talking or expressing themselves in a way that's, that would be seen as weird or different or crazy, they're still a, an equal participant and they're still listened to. Is that right? 
Exactly. And I think some of what of what we see that really is so detrimental to people is not only are they in an extreme crisis, but then we, we place them at, a bo- at the bottom of a social hierarchy where we don't listen to them. So they get talked about when they're not there and they get yes. talked about in a really special way. They yes. get talked down to, they're labeled. And what the person has to say about their own experience is not really welcomed as part of the discussion. Exactly. And, and so, so the, other, the other feature of this treatment meeting, which is a little bit misleading term, um, and I just want to emphasize it means a meeting about what to do next or, or what kind of treatment to offer, is that as they began to work this way, they began to really discourage conversations about the person at the center of the crisis or the family outside of the treatment meeting. In other words, they introduced this op- the openness of open dialogue, this transparency, so that all decisions and discussions about treatment, what kind of treatment, questions about medication, all of that is discussed openly. It's not discussed behind the person's back. There is not a decision that is made and then applied to the person. The person is allowed to see, which I think also has a demystifying effect, the differences that professionals may have, the disagreements that professionals may have. The person who may be experiencing what you just referred to as madness is encouraged to find words to communicate what they're going through. And you see that professionals disagree, you see professionals taking risks and having their meanings challenged and so you can see that so instead of instead of having what Bakhtin would call, Bakhtin is a Russian literary uh, a literary critic and, and philosopher who was very influential in um, op- the development of these ideas instead of getting the official story, which is dehumanizing and objectifying and damaging and wounding, you're allowed to see the unofficial processes that go usually go on behind clo- closed doors. And that tends to equalize the power arrangement. And it tends to support the voice and the clarity of the person at the center of the crisis. I mean, one of the things that I was so amazed by, when I went to Finland, um, my colleague said, you know, what we call, quote, psychosis, when, when, when people get into the, this actual treatment meeting, often these ideas will disappear as they are treated with respect, are given voice, and the teams really work with people in high distress to help them, to assist them in being able to express themselves. So one of Yako's really original contributions, there were two principles that he brought into the treatment meeting. This is Yako Sekula, who's the founder of the Open Dialogue. Yeah. The two principles that he brought in was two principles which are very foreign to our society. One is the idea of tolerating uncertainty. You need to be able to tolerate uncertainty long enough that the person at the center of concern and other people can begin to find their voices, express themselves, more common understanding can be generated, and then an organic solution can emerge. Not a solution you impose on people, but a solution that they themselves have a part in creating. And then the other idea is this word called dialogism, which all that means is it's a very meticulous back and forth between the person at the center of the crisis and the therapist who may be conducting the meeting to make sure in a real, with a really fine focus and attention that that person is, is given support and the attention to be able to find the words to begin to express what they're going through. So that even if they come in and they can't communicate or they're communicating in ways that are very difficult for others to understand, over time within the meeting, there's a special attention that's given to that person to make sure that they can begin to find a language in which they can have a voice. And I think I began to say that I was so amazed, you know, when I first began to sit in on these meetings how therapeutic, first of all, how calm I felt in the meeting, and then how therapeutic this this meeting seemed seemed to be. And people who presented in very extreme states 
seemed to really reorganize or organize themselves differently when they felt heard and respected. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. We're speaking today with Mary Olson. Mary is a family therapist and scholar. She's a professor at Smith College School of Social Work who recently had a Fulbright grant to study alternative mental health care approaches in Finland. She's the founder of the Mill River Institute, and we're speaking about the open dialogue approach to extreme crisis. So Mary, give us give us an example of a family or a situation or a crisis that you've worked with. One of the things that struck me is I saw a video of one of these open dialogue sessions and there was the whole social network around the person who's in crisis or considered to be the psychotic person who needs help. And it, it, the social network included elements of the family. It also included the person's therapist. And in this example from the video, there was a change that happened, but the change was in the attitude that the therapist had, which was part of the problem was something that was going on with the therapist, not the person who was necessarily identified as, as being the problem person. And so it was addressing the entire system and how, how to help the system to start to change. And it really struck me the idea that psychosis, um, if we want to use that word, isn't something that is inside of an individual, but it's something that happens between people, that the relationships go haywire, the communication gets tangled up. And then if we can sort of start to unfold that and start to disentangle it, give us some examples of some of the things that you've seen that have been helpful for people. I was in that treatment meeting and that was really an interesting example. This was a young man who was in, Open Dialogue was originally developed for quote first episode, but over time it's just been used widely both with acute onset and also chronic situations. And this is a young man who was in his early 20s and he already had been through a panoply of hospitalizations and treatments and he was involved in the courts and he had assault charges um, hanging over his head. When he first came to this center where Yako and I and his colleague Tapio Salo did this open dialogue uh, meeting with the treatment team, he had been on very, very high doses of every kind of possible medication and there, the nurse prescriber there was beginning to bring the amounts of medication that he was on, um, bring them down. He had gotten into some kind of fight with a neighbor and that ended up with an arrest. I know that he was uh, became assaultive with the various involuntary hospitalizations that he had had, although, you know, that happens to many people when they're involuntarily committed. Yeah, they it just makes people more aggressive and more violent when you are locked up against your will and put in restraints and treated in a very violent way. Exactly. So um, so that was his history, and he was well on his way to becoming um, defined as chronic. But he was having difficulty communicating. I mean, he wasn't talking in an, what we would consider an ordinary way of expressing his needs and desires and d expressing himself, right? Right. He was, he was not um, expressive. He was on high doses of medication. Well, the, the meeting started in the usual way, which is that, Yako, the usual way with open dialogue is you, you focus on asking each person how they would like to use the meeting. And so he went around from person to person and um, started with the therapist because she's the one who had asked for this meeting. And so she described how she was very concerned because in her individual sessions with this young man, he talked about day-to-day -day things, but she was afraid that he wasn't talking about the things that were most difficult in his life, you know, the, the traumas associated with these, pro these past hospitalizations, um, his parents' divorce, what was happening in the legal system because he was court involved. So he was not talking about these, um, these very difficult things, but he was talking more, more concretely about what happened that week or in, you know, what was happening at his job. So she was concerned that he wasn't talking about these, um, these thing these these deeper concerns and that's why she called the meeting and and what later came out was that she was actually afraid of him and she told stories about being in the clinic and seeing him and going around and you know 
uh, making it look like other people were in the clinic so she wasn't there with him alone. So she, um, she had some fear of this young man. And that's what motivated the meeting. And so Yako went around and, and she, did, she didn't express that fear. She only expressed that fear after the meeting was over. But he, so he went from person to person. And, um, and in the course of doing this, the mother started to become tearful. And in this way of working, there's a lot of emphasis placed on em- the emotions, the f- feelings as being the transmission of meaning. The idea is that the self is embodied. So when she began to become tearful, I asked her what the tears were about. And then she proceeded to describe in a lot of detail and at length the history of this family. And this story had not been told. Her son sat there and was listening, seemed to be listening attentively, but didn't say a lot until at some point Yako asked him, I think it was Yako asked him about um, his thoughts about what was going on. And he asked him, you know, in order to kind of get a more network perspective, you know, if your father were here, what would he say about what we're talking about, what your mother has said and so forth. At this point, this young man said very clearly, I think for the first time ever, I really want my parents to be separate. And that seemed to be very important because he was asserting what he wanted and saying that he really didn't want to be what seemed to be like in this this terrible loyalty bind between these two parents. But it seemed to me that he found his voice at that moment. So he's someone who's very disempowered, who hasn't really been asked what he wants, doesn't really have any self-determination. And this meeting um, helped him to start to reclaim that to some degree. Exactly. It seemed to bring that forward. And so, long story short, uh, that meeting occurred in January, and I went back and did a follow-up nine months later. And I was completely stunned and amazed by what I saw. I walked in, and... Um, this young man seemed to be in a very, very different place. He was outgoing. He was funny. He was telling stories. His mother looked completely different. She looked much, much happier. And so I told them, you know, that this was a follow-up. It wasn't, you know, any kind of therapy session, but I just wanted to find out how things were going and, you know, what had happened since we had this meeting. And What had happened is, first of all, there'd been this really fundamental shift with the therapist who said that she was no longer afraid of this young man, of his behavior, or the fact that he wasn't talking about what he should be talking about. And he, she said she relaxed. And I think at that point, she gained access to her own resources. And um, there was a, a somewhat light, somewhat playful relationship that emerged at certain moments between this young man and the therapist. So the therapist had this fear of her client, and that was really getting in the way of her actually having a relationship with him, and maybe she's pressuring him to focus on topics that she wants to talk about. But the meeting that you had, the open dialogue, she was able to see more deeply the context that he came out of, to hear the story from the mother and also to see that his what his concerns were and then their relationship changed the attitude that the therapist had changed and that really helped things to start get get moving for him exactly he began i asked him you know what his life had been like and he acknowledged that he thought that he was beginning to take his life in a much more positive direction and again i mean i was completely amazed because he went back to school he had a very successful spring semester. He began to coach some kind of high school sports, soccer, I think. And what he, ta- what he described, so we're, I was talking about this, and he described how he began to really make his own decisions, you know, that he had a part-time job he didn't like. And so he, in the next 
session after the open dialogue meeting, he came to the session with his mother, with the therapist, and said, you know, I really want to stop doing this job. And he seemed to need their permission. And they, they said, okay, you know, if that's really what you want to do. And he took one step, another step. He wrote a letter about the treatment he had received at one of the hospitals to a medical association, which seemed to really free him from the past. So he challenged some of the mistreatment that he had experienced. He challenged the mistreatment, yeah. And he didn't want to discuss that letter. He really, you know, it was clear that he felt that that had closed that chapter and he didn't want to get into it and describe what he said, but it was important that he'd written that letter. And then he, he apparently was a very good writer and He was actually a very good communicator, and he got a job as a sports writer for the local newspaper. And so when I saw him in August, he was doing well in school. He was holding down a part-time job and told a couple of really hilarious stories about it. And he was doing this sports writing and getting paid for it. So to step back for a second, what do you think happened? I mean, here's a family that's kind of stuck as an individual who's been on heavy, heavy medications, who's been considered violent, um, who's not communicating very well, who's really disempowered, not making any decisions and, and not having a lot of control over their own life. And then something happens in these open dialogue meetings and the mother talks about the family story and the therapist's attitude changes, her fear um, gets addressed. Um, what is it that happens there that actually helps someone to change their life so so dramatically? He spoke about the value of the relationship with the therapist and the fact that she really listened to him and that he had never before had this experience of a professional really listening and genuinely responding to him as a human being and not as, quote, a case or a diagnosis. So I think that the relationship with the therapist who called the meeting was very, very helpful. But I think that open dialogue meeting was the beginning of humanizing his story. So he no longer became this frightening person, but the therapist was no longer afraid and and he responded to that the fact that she was she had somehow shifted in her responses to him i think the fact that he began to really for the first time perhaps assert himself find some glimmer of self determination in that meeting and he continued and the therapist they continued to build on that, perhaps. I think one of the things that's powerful about this approach is just the idea that dialogue, that people getting together and deeply, deeply listening to each other and appreciating each other and respecting each other as equals has some kind of therapeutic, healing, positive, restorative um, effect. And I think that that's true throughout society. It's not just mental health. It's just something that can be used in conflict. It's something that can be used in community problems. I think so, absolutely. I think so, absolutely. Um, And I think it also was very much, you know, it says a lot about this young man. I think that he was sitting on a lot of, of talent and energy and determination that somehow somehow perhaps the the meeting and then the response of the therapist and she was she she is a very very skilled therapist you know very non-pathologizing very skilled in I'm not crazy about the term strength based I think that's a problematic term but but she was a very skilled in seeing his strengths and I think it not it's not just what the professionals did I think this this was a very um, creative young man and a very talented one and somehow the, the meeting and then the events around the meeting the way she responded the way the mother responded just opened a door and he could walk through and he could reclaim his life I think a lot of what happens is that people have resources for recovery and for getting their lives together but if they're surrounded with messages that say madness has no meaning your ideas your thoughts your expressions are just meaningless signs of a broken mind. And if you're constantly being turned into the pathologized, disordered problem one, 
that creates huge obstacles for you finding finding yourself. Absolutely. And it sounds like open dialogue really removes that. It's very much a, a, the idea that psychosis happens between us. Madness is something that happens between people. It's meaningful if it's understood in context. Exactly. And let's not pathologize people. Let's not say that you're different because you are this disordered, schizophrenic, psychotic, mad one, and we are the treatment professionals. But it says, hey, we're all human here, and your your problems and your experiences actually have meaning, and, and you can get back control of your own life. Exactly. And and I think, you know, we have these really detrimental practices in our society that turn people in distress into walking zombies. And the open dialogue re- began to reverse that as well as the mother and this young man himself. And when when I came back in August, he was he was alive. And so was the mother, and so the whole system was alive. It wasn't just him. The, 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 you know, the therapist looked completely you know, invigorated. It was completely different. And it sounds like one of the ingredients here, too, is that they had the wisdom to reduce his medications, which can just put a complete stop to any kind of growth process for a lot of people. I mean, I'm not absolutely anti-medication, but I've seen this. I mean, if you are tranquilized to the point of not being able to speak or not being able to move because you're on such heavy doses of medication, it's not going to be possible for you to do much psychological growth and and healing in that state. Right. The medications can really stop your ability to call on your own dialogical resources or your own psychological resources. And I think that that's also very important because the nurse prescriber who was working with this young man really understood and was very wise about the fact that often it's low doses are much more effective than high doses. This kind of cocktail of different medications counteracting other medications can be extremely detrimental to people. And so she also, and they were working on bringing all this down. He was on some medication when I saw him in August, but but far less than he had been at the height of his, quote, illness. One of the questions that I have about open dialogue is the way that it does make room at the table for everyone, including the family members, the parents. And what about a situation where someone is experiencing abuse, where they're being mistreated, sexual abuse, or there may be sexual abuse in the past, or there's some kind of um, emotional abuse that's happening. What about the dangers of not protecting the person from the family if the family itself is hurting them and that they may be need to be to separate or to create some distance uh that's a very very a very important point um it's very very complex because it's hard to talk about it in the abstract obviously the whole na- no- notion of open dialogue is to create a safe space and so every measure is taken to make the person at the center of the crisis safe because there is such a terror associated with being in this kind of extreme state. And the complexities of abusive parents has to be handled with the safety and protection of the person at the center. That has to be your utmost value. I think it's it's difficult to talk about it in the abstract because what you would do in one situation may or may not be what you would do in another situation. If the family is, if there's actual, you know, legal abuse in a family, then in the open dialogue approach, you'd also have the protective workers there as well, at the very least. In other words, everybody attached, all the professionals attached and the authorities actually attached to the situation would also be present. Now that, I think, doesn't translate well in a U.S. context, but that's how they work in Finland. Trying to translate into a U.S. context is complicated, but I don't think it's outside the scope that in a situation of abuse, you might actually have a protective worker there, the abusive parent, and the child if she if she agreed to it or he agreed to it. But the dialogue is going to be based on the voluntary participation of the client. If the client doesn't want to sit down with their abusive mother, their abusive father, there's no coercion here that would force them. No, there's no coercion. There's no coercion. And and, but the point is that if there's abuse going on, it could be quite useful to empower an abused person to say some difficult things to the person who's been hurting them. Well, that's the other side of, of staying in contact with your family. I mean, I know a lot of people who have separated from their family because of abusive situations, and I, I don't blame my parents, but my my father is a Korean War 
veteran and my mom is an abuse survivor and there was a lot of very difficult things that happened in our family and so I needed to separate from them but the other side of that is that my separation made it so that it was incomplete in a sense I didn't have the chance and now you know I'm getting older and those things are are different but when you just just to see separation as the only response to an abusive situation can often close off the opportunity of confronting your abuser and changing the relationship, standing up for yourself, saying things that you haven't said before. And it sounds like that could be a positive side of the open dialogue context if someone is being abused, is that it might help them to bring it out into the open and, and to ad- address it. Exactly. I think I think one of the cultural differences, I think one of the reasons it's this it's difficult to translate into a U.S. context is that in, in the Finnish Open Dialogue, there's an absolute commitment to creating an environment where family members talk about the most difficult things in the family. But the Finnish context around communication is very different. They're actually, even though it's a silent culture in many ways, when they speak, they're much more direct. And there's this idea that when you speak, you need to be truthful. In a U.S. context, the fear is that the, you would get a family into some kind of meeting and the therapist would just make nice. So the idea is if, if you have abuse present, it's one of the most difficult things, but you have to be able to talk about it. You can't just gloss it over. And it has to be named, I think, as abuse. So the the idea of how you would talk about it would be very different, I think, than our misconception that you're somehow meeting with the family and letting them get away with terrible activity. The idea is that if they're present, you empower the person at the center of the crisis to talk about what's most important to them and support them in that. Mary, we don't have a lot of time, but what do you think are some of the obstacles to bringing the open dialogue approach into greater use in the United States? Well, I think there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of obstacles, but I think that it is a very valuable model for the problems that we have. One of the differences is that they have a well-funded, well-organized mental health system and here where people can work in teams and they have the money to pay people to work in teams with the notion that if it's labor intensive at the beginning, but in the end, you, you save costs and you save lives. Here, we're very fragmented. Community mental health agencies can't afford to pay people to work in teams. But the idea that we need to find models that can integrate it makes it much more crucial. But ironically, this approach, because it does get people out of the system and off of disability and out of the hospitals, it's actually cheaper in the long run what they're doing in Finland than what's happening in the United States because we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. So I think that what needs to happen is that the priorities, like you say, need to be going in to a resource rich approach at the moment where it's most effective because in the long term, you're going to end up saving money with that client because they're not going to be coming back to the hospital. They're not going to be on disability their whole lives because they got the help that they needed when they needed it. Exactly. And I, you know, I think the other, um, we are a very individualistic society and Finland actually is a more uh, socially oriented society so there's more of a sense that we should in Finland that we should take care of one another and here I think we're too individually oriented and so the idea of allocating all these resources and trying to preserve the relationships around people who are, who are going into these kinds of, of states, that's not a high social value because we put so much em- emphasis on, quote, the individual. Even though all the research shows that if you look at the trajectory of people who have a first break, that those who are able to maintain their relationships have a much better outcome down the road than if they become isolated. I've seen that over and over again. It's really it's the social relationships that are healing, which is why the work that I do in the Freedom Center and the Icarus Project and now my counseling work is so much focused on relationship and social contact and creating community around people. 
Exactly, but our system really aids and abets a kind of social destruction of the person and an induction into the patient role, which is very, which, which is very, very, very difficult to reverse once you get that in place. And it also is very profitable because those individuals become consumers of the marketplace for pharmaceuticals and mental health services. So there's this incentive, in a sense, to keep people sick. Exactly. And then the last point that, of course, medication in some instances can be helpful and etc. But the United States, we no one medicates people who are in acute crises the way we do in the United States. And when I was visiting Karaputis Hospital, one of the um, psychologists there looked at me and he said, you know, I heard that in the U.S. it's practically illegal not to medicate people who are diagnosed with psychosis. Which is, which is really true. I mean, the, pro the professionals are so afraid of malpractice or violating the standard of care or being blamed if something goes wrong that just to medicate someone to the point of immobilizing them in a lot of cases, just blunting their mind is, is really, that's pretty much how people are responded to in this culture. And of course, we automatically put people on inpatient units when they're in these states. And once you're on an inpatient unit, the person is anxious and they're frightened. And so there are much higher doses of medication used when someone is hospitalized than if there's a way to keep them safe, but to keep them in their own setting. And the reason to put people in the hospitals is supposedly to make them more safe, but they're very, very unsafe feeling environments because of the... And then just another point in Finland, I mean, not to, no, Finland is not a psychiatric utopia. I mean, I'm not uh, suggesting that they have many stories to tell about situations in which they wish they had been able to be more helpful. But but I think they are inspiring because I think they're humanizing what here can be such an inhumane approach to people who are really suffering in deep and profound ways. And finally, you know, the point is that obviously there are instances where someone in Finland at Karapotis Hospital needs, they feel, everyone feels, the person feels that they need, would benefit from being in the hospital for a while. But the hospitalization is not used to reinforce a diagnosis or to drug them until they're numb. It's used to organize the social network around the person so that when they leave the hospital, there's a functioning social network around them. They're not discharged into a homeless shelter. They're not put out into the world having been labeled with all this, th these frightening labels with no sense of a future. So the idea is to really create a working team, a working s uh, network around the person so that they, they have a world to return to. Mary, we are just about out of time. Tell us a little bit about the Mill River Institute and also how people can get in touch with you and find out more about Open Dialogue. I am the founder of the Mill River Institute in Haydenville, Massachusetts with Yako Sekula, and it is a training institute in dialogic network practice. Get in touch with me by email because our website is not up and running yet. The email address would be brassworks.millriver at gmail.com. Mary Olson, thank you for joining us today on Madness Radio. It's been my pleasure. You've been listening to an interview with Mary Olson. Mary is a family therapist and scholar. She's a professor at the Smith College School for Social Work. She was a Fulbright Grant recipient studying alternative mental health in Finland, and she is the founder of the Mill River Institute. And we've been speaking about the open dialogue approach to helping people in extreme states of distress. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is co-sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Hosted by Will Hall, music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network, including KBOO in Oregon, WXOJ and WBCR in Massachusetts, Alaska's KWMD, and WPRR in Michigan. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net. Thank you.